Well, like, like Simona said, I come from Puerto Rico. It's a, a little bit of a long ways. It's a very, very tiny island in the Caribbean. You might actually not find it. If you look in a very big map, you have to be looking a map of the area to find it. And we have many Pythonistas, but we are kind of a bit of a shy of making an event. So I have an idea. My wife gave me this, and she created a monster. So if you help me, what I want to do is Send a warm regard to our Pythonista friends in Puerto Rico. And at the count of three, let's say, Chao Puerto Rico. What do you think? My selfie. Yes. No, this is going to be a short video. Let's do that. Uno. Chao uh, Puerto Rico at tres. Si? Uno. Technology, yes. Uno, do it, three. Ciao, Puerto Rico. Thank you. <laughs> <We're>, <clears throat> well, and also, excuse me, because my voice, I had too much fun at five, um, five years last night. So, uh, this is my talk. Let's talk about uh, basically the best. Uh, product for, for, for background tasks in, in Django, Celery. Um, this is me, you can find me. I was very lucky to find my name available, so I just sniped it as, as fast as I could. I work for Cryptico, and, and they're the, my primary employer. Uh, they were very kind to send me here. They do every year, that's, that's why I'm so blessed to be here with you today. I'm also a managing partner at uh, Maya EDMS and uh, at Paperless Inc, uh, two uh, paperless uh, solutions. One is open source, and the other is an enterprise level open source solution. They are both done, also done in Django. And from the, these three companies, they use uh, Celery a lot. And from uh, different scenarios that we encounter is uh, all the lessons that I'm gonna share with you today. So, so what is Celery? Uh, everybody says, if, if you wanna do cron or schedule tasks, use Celery, Celery, Celery. So, what's Celery? In a short, this is their official uh, um, uh, explanation. It's a simple, flexible, reliable, distributed system to process vast amounts of messages uh, while providing operations with the tools required to maintain a social system. It's a cube which focus on real-time processes while also supporting task schedules. So, so what is that? To make things, you know, scalable, asynchronic, and whatever boss words is uh, in, in fat right now, and you, your boss requires you to do it. Uh, basically, it means Django is uh, very synchronic, it's, it's very attached, it's very designed on top of its uh, uh, response, uh, request response schedule, and things just don't happen outside that cycle unless you do a, 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 a management command. So Celery helps us uh, with these usually four uh, scenarios that we need uh, when we are going to expand our, our project, which is uh, I need something to happen outside uh, the usual click and I wait and something happens. I need something to happen outside that action. I also need to something uh, happen after I click. I need something to continue happening in the background. Um, I need to better scale. I need to distribute a task into as much processing power I have available and then recollect, um, like doing like a so, sort of a map reduce. I need to spread a task, uh, use as much processing power I have and then collect whatever messages I get back. And I also need things to happen in a scheduled manner. I need every Friday uh, the session logs of Django to be purged, which is something I'm sure all of you do, right? You need to purge the sessions. You do know that. So this is a typical cycle of a, of a web app in Django. A request, something happens, we get it back. Sending email in Django. We do a request, we send the email, and while the email back, back in is talking to the server, you're still looking at the clocks for something to happen. If the server is slow, it might be a second, two, or three, or five. And that's it's just, it's just not just a reality that your users are gonna cope with. Schedule data cleanup, for example, some stuff needs to happen with, without your input, like logs, uh, cleanup, session cleanup, um, maybe a um, purge of the database, maybe some, um, query to do a reduce overnight. In, for example, in Maya, we deal a lot with, with PDF work. Um, 
uh, Microsoft Word documents of all kinds. So we um, distributed the thumbnail on the preview making process to, to be as fast as possible. And this is a good example of how uh, Celery can actually help you scale a process because uh, you can send three requests to Django and Django send those three requests to the broker and they are distributed into three different processes in parallel, for example, and then you recollect three uh, thumbnails generated in parallel, which usually requires a uh, sequential if you're using a template uh, tag to create the, 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 the thumbnails, which is usually the case. Um, in my and in other processes, you might need long running processes. This is something you, you um, schedule to work and it's not going to be available in one or two or five seconds. It's, this is, might take actually five or ten uh, uh, minutes. So uh, you need to have uh, this uh, process uh, to continue running in the background and affect something in the database long after you even close the browser. So OCR processing is also a very use, uh, good case um, situation for Celery, for example. And it, as you can distribute, you can also uh, spread the load of the entire document into different uh, processes. Uh, this process will do the OCR for the first page, second page, third page, and you can actually OCR our entire document in parallel, for example. So, so this is basically the, the eagle eye view of what Celery is. Um, Celery is a, a Python app, it's not a Django app. It does integrate very nicely with, Py with Django, but it's actually a Python app. It can also integrate with uh, Flask, with Twisted, with, with basically anything that is Python based and that you can uh, define a function and, and decorate it. It will work with that, it, with, with, with that framework. So Celery collects um, functions that your Django uh, app calls and translates them into a message. A message uh, is roughly a uh, text, a text message, which is sent to a broker, which will distribute or route it and hold it in queues. And your workers, which are Django processes, but running in a different way, started outside of the process of Django, of, of, your, of your front end, they were started separately, so they run on the different processes in Linux, will start consuming those messages as they come. After the task, the workers finish processing the task, whatever result they obtain, they will uh, store in what Celery calls a result storage. It can be, and, and it supports a few backends. So you can store them in, in, in the database or you can store them in Redis. And then you collect them. Your, your Django apps might collect those results eventually, or they might be stored by the worker in, in directly into the database. That's up to you, but it gives you that flexibility. So this is the Wikipedia uh, long version of what a message broker is. But what's most important, I think, is that Celery is not a broker. Celery uses brokers. So in this regard, Celery can actually support quite a bit technologies for you to route how you're gonna choose how to route your messages from your front end to your worker back end. It is mostly designed to use Rabbit, and you're gonna see why. But it can also support Redis as a broker. The result storage, as I say, is the task run in the background, you don't know when, you don't know where they're gonna finish, but you need to be able to access whatever um, result they're gonna return to you. And um, Celery can also use several backends to store the results. Um, and cache, even the ORM of Django, uh, Redis, <coughs> Rabbit, and even MongoDB. So why separate things? because your, your app is now separated from the workers by space and time. Why space and time? Now you have to start thinking asynchronically. Now you don't have one app, you actually have two apps. You have the real-time app that happens in, that's interactive, and you have a new backend that is gonna happen, you don't know where, you don't know when, and you don't know how. It might actually be running in two different computers if you're using a cluster environment. It could actually, if you're using virtual machines, it could be running in two different zones. It could be even running in different technologies now. It could be running in different languages. And it, they will definitely be running outside the same time scale. 
it will happen at different states of your system because at the beginning where you schedule the task, you might only have 10 records in your database, but at the time that the task eventually run, the state of your entire application is gonna be completely different. And here starts the first lessons. The life of a asynchronous programmer is a lonely one because even in, in the software community, asynchronous knowledge is, is a kind of a, a niche knowledge. You, these are the, the, the first lessons that you have to think when you think asynchronous, is that your task, you will never know the state of things at the time you schedule a task. So your, all, your workers will most always introspect the state of things, even the database. So task queuing is like Python multiprocessing. It is not, because you are not running processes in the same machine. You, are, you don't have shared memory, which is the first thing we use in multiprocessing to do logs and semaphores and messages. And because we are not used, the workers on the front end might not be running even in the same technology, you cannot pass object. You should, you can actually, but you shouldn't. Because the object you're passing might not even exist in the database at the time that the task is going to use it to process. So the best thing to always do when using Celery is pass only the IDs of your models to the task. Please don't pickle the object. Don't pickle your, your model instances because at the time the task is going to execute them, that model, those, that, that model fields might be completely different and the, the worker is going to be working with stale data of stuff that might not even exist anymore. Um, because you're sending stuff through a wire that only that is optimized for text messages. Everything you send to the task must be you must be able to serialize. That means resist the urge for complex data type. Only send to your task as argument, text, and numbers. It's going to make your life very, very easy. How do you serialize stuff to send into salary tasks? Our salary actually supports quite a few um, simple and sophisticated serializers. My recommendation of what we've seen in production, stick to the basics. JSON is very fast, it's very well supported in Python. Um, it's very simple to debug. And at all costs, don't send complex data type, especially dates. Dates in Django are now time zone aware. And uh, as you know, JSON has a very big problem serializing dates. Don't serialize dates. Don't send dates as argument to your tasks. This is the basic configuration. With this, you're going to set every single aspect of Celery to be working with JSON uh, serialization. Tasks, as I mentioned, can return you results of whatever processing they did. If you don't need the task, the result, the task doesn't return a result, ignore it explicitly with this command. It will disable quite a few parts of Celery and improve efficiency. For example, in the case of a thumbnail, I don't need the task to return me, yes, I was able to do the thumbnail, no, I was not. I just want that, that task to create a file, and then I will try to search for that file. Uh, because this is not mathematical processing, I don't need a result. So I explicitly, explicitly for this task, ignore the result, and that starts to disable quite a bit of block of code from Celery. Celery has a concept of, of queues. They are like channels where you can actually use to route your tasks. You can group your tasks in different queues, split them. Don't use one single task for all uh, one single queue for all your tasks because some tasks might be short-lived. Some tasks might last one minute. If you use one single queue, even if you have many workers, your long-running queues are going to cause a traffic jam in the queue and your short-running tasks will not be executed in the time frame that they need. You can specify in the task definition which queue they're going to use. My recommendation is if you are going to be doing uh, reusable apps, don't do that in the task. Do that using the new incredible system that Django provides, the app config. In your ready method, tell the app where 
it is going to route all of its tests. Don't do it at the test because this way you give the control to whatever is using your app to reroute your tests, whatever, however they see fit. Uh, this way is more dynamic. And, and it's just a dictionary where you pair the path to the module of, that defines the test and the name of the queue that you are going to route it into. You can run, once you have your queues defined, you can execute workers that will consume those queues. If you divide your, your task in queues, now you can set different amount of workers for each queue. So if you need OCR to happen much faster, now you can spin up workers only for the OCR queue. If you need um, thumbnails to be generated much faster because the user are using your system much faster than your, your workers can, pro can, can digest that, those queues, you can now spin up workers just for that queue. If you don't specify the queue for the workers, by default, they will consume messages from all queues, which make it, it makes it very easy because you can also just spin up one worker and it will consume tests from all queues and it's good for testing. And then in production, you spin up different workers and you assign them to different queues. So if you don't specify a, a queue, when, when the third worker spins up, it will find all the defined queues in your app and it will start to uh, register itself to receive notifications of tasks of messages in those queues. It will do that for default. If you define uh, different queues, you can then assign workers for specific queues. And you can specify more than one worker for each queue also. You can also group now your queues, because if you have, for example, uh, emailing, in the case of Maya, we can also do document indexing and handle the uploads from the user. Those are tasks that take a moderate amount of time. So we can, excuse me, you can, we can group those queues in a worker that will handle middle um, traffic uh, queues, queues that will handle middle traffic. And you can also then have uh, task queues and you can also group them separately. Uh, stuff that will happen in the background on the long run or um, clean up stuff you can then group one worker for long running task in long running queues you can also group queues the problem with queues and django is that they create a new type of race condition because message queues are so optimized especially for example rabbit was designed to handle telecommunication it can route messages very, very fast. How fast? This is an example of a, it's, yeah, it's a very bloody, but the person, the, the, the part on the, on the bottom is important. Find that difficulty, uh, the, the, the stack trace, the task will give you. I just uploaded a document, and the system will tell me that document doesn't exist for OCR. And I, I know that I uploaded, I upload the document, Django creates a record in the database. After creating the record in the database, it sends the message to the broker that that document needs to be handled. The message is then routed to a worker. And when the worker went to the database, it went to the database so fast that the database still hadn't had enough time to commit the record. So brokers are even faster than database. Lesson, be mindful of commit delays or replication delays. Because if you're doing passwords in a replication environment and you're using logs, even the two second delay will be so much bigger than the delay the message will take, you will be chasing a ghost error message a few days. You can have preventive delays. If your test runs so, so fast, usually on an empty queue, you can add a configurable delay of just one second, uh, or usually something bigger than the expected delay of the migration of the, um, uh, the replication of the database. Um, Celery has one a few uh, good tools to monitor your, your queues. One, this is one called, uh, it's called Flowers, it's a third party. 
I also like very much uh, Rabbit has a very good management tool by default. This, uh, they include this one. And it's very useful because you can see how your queues, um, the amount of messages your queues have. And this is a very good indication of when you need to scale up. If your queues are consistently full, it means you don't have enough workers. If your queues are consistently empty, it means you have too many workers. Uh, too many workers is good unless you are paying for them. So usually the uh, the size of the, the amount of messages in a queue over a period of time is a good indication of, of, of your need to scale up or scale down. But don't micromanage your queues or your tasks. Um, pros and tax, for example, consuming system messages, you, don't, you should not be monitoring and doing cleanup of processes. Let Celery do that for you. And that you do. just let your task die in a in a control way. So what you can do is you can put timeouts. Meaning, if this task takes more than twenty seconds, kill yourself. It means you are you are stuck. The good thing about timeouts is that Celery handles the handles the timeout, not the task. So even if the task is frozen, it will get killed. It will not keep consuming system processes on the long run. But you have to do this for each task. You can also use global timeouts. For example, I, I, I can set a one single default of 60 seconds. And after 60 seconds, even if I don't specify timeout, all my tasks, no, no single task in the system will last more than 60 seconds, for example. So you set this for the most expected amount of, of running time of a task. And then you fine tune by giving each task a specific lower timeout. And you can also give soft timeout to tasks. This is a, a, a type of timeout in which the task will get a notification from Celery tell, telling it, your time is up. Bring your stuff up, I'm going to kill you. And it will give you time for your task to free up some resource or a, a log or, or something in the database. But if your task is frozen, this will not work. So use soft timeouts also in conjunction with hard timeouts. If one is not a uh, soft, it's not a substitute for the other one. And in soft timeout, uh, your, not, your task gets notified by a, an exception. So that we will raise an exception inside the task is a soft time limit exceeded. And if you capture that, your task then can do some cleanup. As I said, it won't work if the task is frozen. Uh, retries. You can also program your task to retry whatever they were doing if there's an error. Uh, in this case, uh, what we found works best is that you use an, a static configurable amount of delay if your task is using local resources, is uh, using a um, SMTP server that you control, for example, then you can you can use a single static um, retry. For example, five seconds, and if it fails, five seconds later it will retry. But if you're using an external service, use increasing uh, timeouts. And for example, I tried to ping uh, Twitter, and the API didn't respond. And, it, and so I do a delay of three, uh, three, uh, three seconds. It doesn't respond yet, I do five. It doesn't respond, then ten. So I give Twitter time to, uh, to catch up with the, probably the, uh, the overhead they are having right now. And I'm, I'm not contributing to their blockage right now. Celery has a very nice feature called um, rate limits in which you can program the behavior in terms of uh, concurrency, how much I can allow this task to run in a, in a given amount of time. For example, I, want, I don't want uh, 100 OCRs to happen in less one, than a, one hour. I don't want that task to run so many processes. So I can do rate limits. The thing about rate limits is that you usually don't need them because they are very specific to your code and your project and they add an, an, an absurd amount of complexity to, to Celery's uh, handling of tasks. So you can actually implement simpler, simple and more targeted rate limiting in your own code than using Celery's. And it's, that's even a, a, actually a, an official recommendation. 
we have this, but it's so complex that, that we actually encourage you to disable it if you're not going to use it. So these are things that you can start disabling and doing uh, that usually just um, you don't know they exist and you wonder why your task is, is so uh, simple yet it, it, it's not scaling good fast enough. Another thing is, okay, Celery supports a lot of backends, a lot of drivers, but you use the right tool for the, uh, for the job. I see a lot of people using Redis as a broker. Don't. It's not really meant for that. So, why? I did this as a simple ex example, uh, a simple, uh, I did this in Google, and yes, a lot of people are having issues, yet I searched for Redis queue on GitHub, and I found 549 repositories pretending to do to use Redis as a, a, message, a message broker. So people apparently are very, um, they like pain. So the argument is that Redis is very fast because it runs in memory. Yes, it is very fast. If you're just storing a value and retrieving it, which is its reason for existence. And we all know that it's better to finish last but get to the finish line. This guy can tell you that. And you want your message to eventually reach their workers. This is Redis' worst enemy. You have, an in, you have a power out, you have a disconnection, your process, your server, uh, ready server process die, you lose all your pending messages. So if you have 500 downloads on queue and ready died, you just lost 500 downloads. So this guy did the benchmark to end all benchmarks, and he actually benchmarked Redis against Rabbit. Redis is memory-based, Rabbit is disk-based. And what he found is that Rabbit consistently outperforms Redis when it comes to message queuing. Why? Because Rabbit was actually designed for this, in his own words. It's even impressed that Redis even came close in terms of performance, because this is very far apart to what Redis was designed to do. So lesson learned. Use Rabbit as a message broker, Redis as a result backend, or the other way around. And this is a little gem I found uh, a few uh, time afterwards. There's a library to talk in Python, uh, optimize. It's a C library to talk to Rabbit from Python. Use this. You just do a pip install, lib Rabbit NQ, and Celery will work even faster by to route uh, messages to Rabbit. Another thing with Celery is that not all queues are important. If you have a queue in which you can survive by losing a message, for example, a task that thumbnail generation, again, if the thumbnail generation was not able to finish, that is not a, a vital loss because I think I could just hit F5 and refresh the screen and force the thumbnail generation. Those queues are ephemeral. I can withstand to lose messages on those queues. So you set those queues as transient in Celery by setting the delivery mode to one. What if that does, again, it will disable a whole lot of code for those queues and optimize the routing of those queues because now Celery knows there those queues, the messages on those queues are not meant to be permanent. They are not meant to be persistent. He doesn't have to care to save them if something bad happened. And if you're using the, the method I just recommended, you will do that in the ready method of your apps, adding delivery mode one. Um, this is another one of the new headaches you're gonna have when you do when you work with task uh, as queuing. Arbor Einstein said that time. It's just a simple method to avoid everything happening at the same time. Sadly, we don't have time in our favor when working with task queues because we can't control time. So you can do resource locking, and this is a word that can cast the worst nightmares because resource locking is just asking for trouble. If you have done locking the first time in Python for some time in Python or any language, you know that a fail lock or a stale lock or a, even a successful lock 
that you um, didn't obtain in the right way can cause great havoc. So much that I actually did a search and there are a few talks about nightmares in resource locking. It is a real topic, apparently. So when you're working with distributed task queuing, a local loss lock is completely worthless because I was able to obtain a file lock using Python's file lock uh, mechanism, but that lock will tell this computer that this resource was locked. The workers are working maybe in another computer and they don't have access to that lock, so they don't know that they're not supposed to touch this resource. So we need a distributed locking system because we don't have shared memory, we don't have shared disks or any real other resource for that matter. So a few people have come up with very good uh, uh, solutions. Uh, Zookeeper, who will have their own internal lot, distributed lot manager called Ch uh, Chubby. Um, there's also, you can also use Consul, which is used a lot in Docker, for example, where you do the, uh, for the, um, when you're doing um, a Docker Swarm, is uh, you can use a console, it works very nicely. And surprise, surprise, here Redis works very nicely because all you're doing is just storing a value in a place where everybody can see it in a single transaction so that only one will succeed. So in this case, Redis is a good uh, choice for distributed, lo uh, uh, distributed locking and Memcache is also a very good choice. And there are several projects to uh, the snippets that will give you a, 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 a Python algorithm to obtain a distributed lock with these backends. What you need in a distributed lock manager is that it is persistent, guarantee persistent, and that writes happen in a single transaction. What else happens uh, has, has, those, uh, has, has that description in our world? Databases, ACID compliant databases, believe it or not, are good to share resource locking even SQLite, which we love to hate, but it's actually a great product. And, and this is an exercise in, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, morbid uh, development practice. Do a distributed log manager using the ORM of Python with SQLite as a backend. It actually works. Because all I need is one record that can only be written by one entity. So what we do is we do a model with just a single field that is unique. And when we try to obtain the log, we try to write a, uh, a field, a, a record on that model, and we force always an insert. And we do it inside a transaction. All those parameters will guarantee us that only if that record doesn't exist and only if only one attempt, even if both happen at the same time, only one will succeed. Because as soon as that record is created, the other one will get an integrity error. That, in, in my nub, is just, I don't recommend this for production, but it, will, it gives you the idea of what it is that happens behind the doors uh, in, in, in the back end of a distributed load manager. Because when it comes to distributed load managers, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, and that's exactly the Python model. Also, you never check for a log's existence. You just try to, to acquire it, and you will get an error if it already exists. If you check for a log, and you notice that the log doesn't exist, and then at the time that you are going to write to the log, you are introducing a race condition because another process might have been doing the same thing, just a, use a, a one step before you, and it will have obtained the log even though your second process thought that that log was available. So when logs, you never check that they exist. You just try to acquire them. So your process acquired the log, meaning it will handle this instance of the ORM of the document, for example, in Maya, I will handle, task one says, I, I have the log, this document is mine for OCR. And that task just died. So that document becomes reserved permanently. So what do we do? You have a problem, it's called infinite log or a stale log. It means somebody obtained a log and did not release it back into the resource pool. And 
Spell locks are also a very big problem, and you can handle them in two ways, in a managed or a cooperative way. If you're using a console or Zookeeper, Zookeeper will actually prune uh, stale logs after a while. It will do that for you. Or you can do that cooperatively, meaning that every time one task can acquire the log, it will check that the same task will do a second try and see if that, if that log has a timeout, if, it's, if the timeout has expired, the, the new task will force to get that time. It, it will reacquire it from the first task that lost it. Do that by adding an a, a timeout or an expiration time for logs. This way, even if a log was acquired by someone else, I know that that log was expired because the person who obtained it, the task that for, or the process that obtained it, did not release it or died. So always have timeout for your logs if you're not going to do ma a managed solution. So I'm going to do a demo. I rehearsed this last night as much as I could. And I'm going to throw another branch into the, the equation. This is another product of mine it's called Django Sabut. It will cause predictable operational failures in your project. And we know operational, I mean operational errors are catastrophic in, in Django. So my my challenge is to provoke operational errors while uploading 500 documents, and none of these, uh, none of those documents will be lost. I will be using a setup that every 500 cursors that the uh, every 500 cursors that my my uh, my app will acquire uh, will trigger one operational failure. It means that the database was not available, and in Django that's fatal. I'm also going to be doing, throwing a few more ranges, branches. I'm going to be using SQLite, which has a very low concurrency. I'm going to be using SQLite as the log manager. I'm going to be running in debug mode and using run server, not even Nginx. So let's see how it goes. You can see I'm not cheating. No documents. Window, I have my front end code. I have one and two workers. Right now, I, have, I don't have any document in the system. So I'm going to upload 500 Lorem Ipsum PDFs as a single zip file. Those are, there, there are a few are, are workers running right now. And every 500 cursors, there's one operational failure happening, which in Django means that this process should have ended quite a few moments ago. So let's do, this is happening too fast. I already have 137 documents processed. So let's do something very nasty. I just stop my workers in the middle of processing a PDF file from a single download. 178 documents, no new document. Let's restart the, doc, the, the workers once again. Workers starting, and it continued very level. Now we have 200 documents, 218, 230. Still happening too fast, so let's do something really, really nasty. Let's set the database in read-only mode at 365 documents we have closed in the process. And our workers are cursing at us right now, spewing all kinds of log errors, uh, critical errors, operational errors, and they keep retrying. We have operational failures left and right. Let's put our database once again in read-write mode. Workers continue once the log and the access was. Work. For 80. Now 
Now they're dealing with all the logs that were acquired but will never expire. And they're now waiting for the, uh, all the processes to continue frantically trying to acquire the logs until they will expire eventually. And here are our documents. Multi-page, storing Ipsum PDFs that were uploaded from a single zip file as a single action and we just introduce five of six, uh, uh, five of, uh, of six are uh, critical errors that we are usually, uh, we just want, we would have uh, basically have a catastrophic problem with this app. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for. <laughs> if you have any questions. Do you have any suggestion to cope with uh, um, workers tasks that might not have been received by RabbitMQ, but you already committed your transaction, and so you actually did something that never got to the task queue somehow, I don't know, connection failed while trying to go back Rabbit. And for example, in case of a registration, you want to consider the user a registrant if he didn't receive the mail to confirm the registration, for example. I don't know. Uh, so the question is, how do we retry? Uh, if you have any suggestion to cope with that, I mean, for example, I might create a registration for a user, and I will have a, a record on my database that the user cannot confirm because the task that sends the email never started, and so he the registration actually is not completed because he never received the mail and so cannot confirm it. That scenario, I would suggest that you do an um, automatic retry at the task level. If the task gets a exception from the MSMTP server, you can capture that. No, I mean, if the task did, didn't even reach RabbitMQ, if you do that after you already saved the, the document, or if you do that before committing the transaction? Do you, do you suggest to schedule the task before committing transaction, after committing transaction? Oh, uh, no, I, I suggest because if after. I, okay, and in that case, you might have the document which is on the database, but there is no task going to process it. Yes, but remember tasks are actions, database is data. Uh, in that sense, data is more valuable than task because with the data, then you can uh, know. Yeah, you can recover the actual. To have a record of the failure at least. But okay. if, if you prioritize uh, broker over database, you don't even know that the, fa the task failed. And I don't know if there's um, a method that Rabbit will retry to send message to a task if it fails. I, I that thing I will have to research also. If that's possible, so that Rabbit could also, or even Celery might also do retries to reach to the task and tell the task, uh, okay, you were not available at the moment this registration was created. Oh, but you are available now here to try to do this. I don't know if that's. Yeah, that's what exactly what I was asking. Is if there is any automatic system or library or whatever you can say. Yeah, knowing Celery and Rabbit, it probably is. The, the Rabbit. Uh, I, um, from Rabbit specifically, it has a very rich ecosystem of plugins. There's plugins for a lot of things. So um, my bet is that there is something in Rabbit to do that more than in Celery. But Celery is Python, so it can also be written to, to support that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question. You, you told us that uh, you can uh, do um, thumbnailing uh, using Celery. Uh, if you have a uh, thumbnailing, it's normally done in the templates. And you, oh, thumbnailing, yes. Thumbnails, yes. And uh, you, if you invoke a template and the um, media files have not been thumbnailed yet, uh, that process waits longer and it, it takes some seconds until you see the first page. 
No, in the case of um, thumbnailing. And no, that's that's the cla that's the classical way as uh, as uh, as done in Django. But how would it be with a salary? You would uh, deliver the render template immediately, and you would uh, add the URLs pointing onto the file system, and there the uh, the media the thumbnail media files are not are not there yet. So uh, Nginx is serving those media files normally. Right. Uh, it's trying, it, it doesn't find it, and then you have uh, broken images. Yes. So how would you solve the problem? Broken images are just a part, in, in the case of document management, a broken image can be solved by doing refresh, because in the case of document management, a thumbnail cannot be permanently created for every page. Um, for example, we support uh, transformations for pages. So the page is generated every time it is accessed because the, the graphical representation of the document might have changed. Uh, if you want to wait to know that a thumbnail exists, you can wait for a task explicitly. I want to wait until this thumbnail is created. What you do is you don't access it from uh, salary. You create a view, for example, that will talk to the task. I will know if the thumbnail is ready. So you call the task one way, and you access the result via a, a view, for example. And the view will know if, if, it, if it is available or no. And the, on the template, uh, tag can talk to that view as an intermediary, intermediary between the templating engine and the task queue. So you don't, you, you don't get any, uh, the page is not loaded faster. They will, they will be loaded faster because you're distributing, you're not working, you're not generating pages in the same context of the front end refresh. You are splitting all the tasks and they are running now in parallel. So that's the problem with parallel processing. You don't, now you have less control in the order of things happen, so you have to check if they're already completed. You cannot assume that they're happening as a sequence of events, as we usually do when we are using <coughs> thumbnail generators in the template. We know that, same, that thumbnails will be generated. If, if it is not available in the disk, the template will generate it and we will have it. If it is generated, the template tag, tag will give us the path to the thumbnail. In distributing uh, system, you don't know if the task generating the thumbnail finished or not, so you check. If it is dead, not there, you wait a little bit and you put a timeout. Thing. Okay, so you you just delivered the template only if all the uh, tasks are uh, have been have finished to something images. Uh, yes, that's the, okay. That's how you do. But in in the distributed system, uh, timeouts not, will now be a necessity for everything. If it, even if it is a timeout of just one second, you can not assume something happened. So you will always check if whatever you send to do somewhere else has finished with just a little bit, uh, even if just one second delay, and that will give ta uh, time for all the t parallel tasks to catch up. Okay, and a second question. You think that uh, channels in Django will obsolete salary in some sense? Uh, it's a very good question. I think not, because channels is designed for something else. Um, I haven't, um, I, I'm not, I haven't read too much about it. Jacopo, I think, did some uh, a talk about it. Yes. Don't replace uh, salary because it, it channels is is all about. I mean, the promise of channels to the yeah, the contract with the other part of the of the of the sauce software is that it will deliver at most one instance instead of at least one so you can't rely on 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 channels to deliver oh, the message okay. that's that's the uh, that's eventual, the eventual. philosophy b between salary i mean okay. e sorry in channels uh, so channels is is uh, a queuing system for something you may um, you may uh, afford to lose 
basically. So that's that th that's the point. Th there's no guarantee for an uh, eventual consistency. Exactly. In exactly. Redis, you can have both eventual or or, or loose lo lucy. You can afford to lose, but you can set in channels. You, you are not a no, no. guarantee that you will get the message. Exactly, because the point of channels is not being a queuing system for tasks, but for messages and basically it's, it's made for web with web, web sockets in mind. So, uh, Celery is much more uh, broad. You can do uh, distributed mathematical system, uh, 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 processing, uh, map reducing channels. Uh, it's more uh, web socket, notification, pull notification. In my app, I need to send a mail for some group of users, and uh, that group I can add, uh, like in, in real time. Uh, can I add uh, some queue uh, without rebooting salary, or something, or is a bad idea? Sure. I use uh, one queue for one group of users, for for emails, and uh, is it a good idea to add queue uh, without rebooting salary? Uh, can can I, can I make it, or it's uh, better to make something something different? If the email is very important to you, I suggest you do it in in Celery. Celery uh, is a very nice fit for for background out of process email sending, and um, and you can actually split your email sending into queues. For example, priority emails like error messages. I need these messages to go to admins really really fast. And you can have uh, registration uh, uh, emails that can go into a separate queue that is being processed or consumed slower. So my suggestion is go with Celery because the, the amount of flexibility you will have uh, is, is worth the, the, the porting of the code. I mean, uh, if maybe I have uh, some customers and some emails must, uh, uh, they must receive in uh, right order. First, second, and after third. Oh, order uh, is never guaranteed. Uh, it's uh, it's not a good idea. No, if you did, if you need the emails in order, don't yeah. rely on the broker. Uh, you must do some sort of uh, you must have you must include a field or a metadata that will that the task will know in which order to send the emails if the sequence is important. The broker will just uh, start doing round robin. If you have four workers, it will go uh, first task you, second you, third you, fourth you, now fifth you. Uh, more, um, basically the same thing as a low balancer in default mode. We, we will do round robin. So uh, uh, the order will be completely lost. So in, uh, in that case, if the order of the emails in which they need to leave the system is important, uh, no, the broker will not guarantee that order. Okay, thanks. Third question? Uh, suppose I wish to notify the user uh, how a task is uh, progressing, how far it has gone uh, at the user interface level or with other kind of notification. Uh, which is the suggested way to, to do it? That is a very common question with task. How, would I, um, how do I get some status of the task? You're going to have to implement that inside the task. And there are a few snippets. Um, there is a, uh, Celery has a, the ability to send a signal to task. So you can use that uh, to send a signal every five seconds, then tell me how many records are, have you processed. And you can use also the same broker to send a message back of the status and then cache that uh, with uh, Django. Uh, I don't have a specific uh, algorithm, but it's a very common use case. And if you search status of task in salary, you will get a few snippets that will get you started. It's, it's a very common use case. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.